Hello and welcome to another episode of Linux Lads. This is episode 109. Looks like it's just myself and Mike. So say hello, Mike. Hello, hello. So just reading through the show notes here, uh, Mike, you put in that Azahi are doing another, or is is it a remix or are they rebasing on Fedora? Or are they shifting away from March? So this is something that uh, just became known this week on the Fedora's conf- Fedora conference in uh, in Cork, actually, here in Ireland, although I haven't been there. But uh, by the time this episode airs, because we are recording it before releasing the one before, so this might be already very old news, and it might be actually happening. But basically, the gist of it is Asahi Linux, uh, the hardware enablement project that creates the custom kernel and uh, puts all the drivers in it uh, and does a lot of stuff that makes the m1 uh, apple hardware and m2 apple hardware work uh, they created and used the kind of reference uh, distribution based on arch linux but that's for them never been the end goal they always wanted to keep making this hardware enablement and uh, polish thing that they do but they wanted it to be adopted by all distribution who are interested in it according to their post which will be in the show notes linked uh, fedora actually very early on fedora started to be very interested in doing exactly that and that is going to lead that at the end of this august planning on releasing the uh, Asahi Fedora remix. So Fedora has got remixes similarly to Ubuntu does as well. You know, if you if you have the normal flagship Fedora distribution that will come with a Fedora workstation with GNOME, but you also have uh, remixes with KDE and other desktop environments or remixes specialized in uh, for specific uh, things. So this is this is one of them. This is basically Fedora with all the Asahi goodies uh, that uh, that will be specifically intended to be used on the uh, what they call the Apple Silicon hardware. Hmm. There is one thing missing from the release, and I didn't see information anywhere else. But I asked them on their Matrix chat uh, what this what desktop environments are gonna be. They are going to be like, recommending or what what it comes from. And they say they had images with both GNOME and KDE. And KDE Plasma is going to be their flagship, which is, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, 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 that's what they did previously on Arch Linux. Mm. When you installed, uh, the, the, the Asahi Linux, the most recommended or the most, I don't want to say official, but the way they recommended it, what you got was Asahi with Plasma. I am definitely going to try it as soon as it's released and like usable because people can apparently use it already, but uh, you know, things are expected to be breaking and so on. Uh, but they hope that within the month they're going to give it ship shaped and so on. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I can kind of see where they're coming from. Um, Fedora, it kind of operates in the, in the place where they're not going after the super stable, like they're kind of somewhere in, somewhere in the middle. Fedora is kind of uh, subdivided into special interest groups uh, and mm-hmm. that produce different, you know, specific distros or remixes and stuff. And some people were very interested in the Asahi project in this, from the start. So, okay, uh, you know, the Asahi project, I, as far as I can tell from their posts and social media and so on, they would be the happiest if every distro just uh, pulled uh, you know, uh, to kind of enable any distro on on this hardware uh, using the Asahi code, because mm-hmm. y- you know the, the the more I imagine the merrier, and they obviously make everything open source. Uh, whatever they can, they put into the or whatever makes sense, and they can they put into the kernel. I would imagine at some stage it's probably going to be NixOS based off the Asahi kernel. There, there are already, I think NixOS is already one of those uh, what they call the old distros where you get a script. To, to get Asahi kernel mm. and build the rest from uh, from from Nix because I think I've seen that one. So you have Ubuntu. I've used that. You have Debian that I'm using now, but that's not. I don't think the Debian, for example, the Debian image is made by Debian project. Mm. Is somebody who glued these things together during installation. Okay. Yeah. And sure. uh, yeah. So it's 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 Linux. So it's you know highly modular, and uh, you can you can make anything as long as you have the know how and the will. Indeed. Um, so watch this space. Another thing that uh, I put in the show notes is Thunderbird have come out with a redesign. So I've been using this for a while because I'm on the beta channel of Thunderbird. And so Thunderbird has been out for uh, a while. There are people who like the way things work. Satisfying those 
their pre-existing user base and not removing features or anything like that while doing a UI redesign overhaul of your application is an incredibly difficult thing to do. And in my opinion, they've completely pulled it off. Not only that, but they've I think they've actually improved the flow, the UI flow of how you access the various diff- things in the application. They have a nice big search bar up at the top now. And they've added more features. So not only do they not seem to have taken features away, they've added more features and yet made it simpler to navigate. So incredible kudos to the uh, Thunderbird design team. So in relation to the redesign, if anyone has not used Thunderbird in a while, uh, I would recommend that you give it a, another shot. And we w- will uh, include in the show notes a It's Foss article where they include screenshots for people who do not like the redesign and want it completely old school or as old school as possible. They've thought of you too. And there's a density control. So you can make it really compact and have as much information as possible on the screen. Um, It's not enabled by default, but it is still there. So if you're old school and just say down with this whole redesign, keep it the way it is, they've thought of you too. So you can always revert it back to more or less how it was before. I use uh, actually Thunderbird on Linux and the official um, Mac mail client on the Mac, which shows that I'm not very discriminative uh, if if I'm happy with that. The reason why I use an email client for on the Mac at all is because it's for work and my company uses Gmail and I just just can't stand Gmail. It's just disgusting (laughs) and it should not be allowed. Uh, Anyway, uh, that's by the by. I came to, I, I always try other things. Whenever I switch to KDE, one of my first things is trying Kmail and failing. It always breaks for me. I don't know. It's, it's uh, too heavy or I, I don't know. Basically something stops working and it stops syncing. And so I, then I switch to Thunderbird and I don't like the look of it as much as I like the native look of Kmail, for example, but it just tends to work. So I keep it. Because, uh, you know, and I haven't had the chance to actually look at the uh, new UI redesign for Thunderbird, but uh, maybe maybe it's going to mark a huge improvement for me as well. What I really appreciated about it, like you change, we've done it recently somewhere, one of the mailboxes that I look after, we've changed um, hosting. The simplest way to change hosting is download, make sure everything downloads from the old one, put in details for the new one, create new mailbox, and then take the emails... Uh, with your mouse just drag it everything from the old one to the new one i've done it twice already for the same uh, place and it just works like a charming thunderbird no matter how many emails there are that's not exactly your day-to-day use but other than that yeah i use it you can very easily uh, switch off uh, html formatting and uh, i've recently uh, sent some forum posts and a patch using uh, using email actually yeah and uh, and they they require that everything has to be done in plain text so switching that off was very nice so yeah i i appreciate the functionality of thunderbird and i use it fairly often when you were talk- mentioned kmail it just reminded me any time that i've tried to use kmail i i admit the problem is is likely on my side, but I just find it completely unintuitive on how, on how to add a, an account. Either it's like some buried sub sub menu or something like that. But I've either haven't successfully added an account to Kmail, or probably more likely is I've no, never uh, successfully added a second mailbox to to Kmail. Whereas in Thunderbird, it's just so easy. I, I did manage to add them, but then it starts, I think it ground to a halt a few times, and then I'm just like, okay, I can't deal with it. And the whole with KD, I think the whole personal information management suite kind of end up in one giant database. I might be completely wrong about this, but it's basically never felt performant enough for me to use. And I know that that must be my, that, that, that that's not always the case. I think, is it Phelim from, from the other podcast who uses it? And, and probably thousands of people use it, right? So it must be good at email. It's, I'm sure it's a good app. I'm not saying anything wrong with the, the software itself. It's just, I'm saying I do not find it intuitive to add the, the mailboxes, uh, whereas Thunderbird just seems to, seems to work. Yeah, it is. It is a. It is a great app, and it has got a lot of. Uh, it's a long-standing project. In other brief news, in terms of Steam usage, anyway, 
Linux has taken over macOS. Yay! <laughs> uh, I think that's a large part to do with the Steam Deck. So the Steam Deck is selling like absolute hotcakes. I've heard that already now 40% of the total Linux desktop users on Steam is is made up by the Steam Deck. So <laughs> the Steam Deck is 40% alone of the entire thing. So they, that's a huge contribution to the fact that um, the Steam percentages of Linux have just absolutely shot up, relatively speaking. That is impressive. I mean, I know I know myself, so when we go have a, a Linux meetup here in Dublin, in the pub, I think out of... There was quite a few of us, but like, I think three Steam Decks, and it was just the people who decided to bring it in. Yeah. Yeah, so it is, it is, we obviously, I don't know, I mean, at least I don't know the sales numbers, but it seems to be extremely popular, and I'm not a gamer, so I don't really look into it too much, but even on my radar, it sometimes pop up that it's becoming the kind of device against which its competitors are defining themselves, right? So... Mm. As far as I can tell, like, basically the questions tend to be, is this going to be the Steam Deck killer? And also, which is a great thing as well, is it's the token question anytime there's a new game released now. Is this going to be on Steam Deck? It's like, it's it's up there. It's like, which is great to see. Uh, it doesn't matter, nor should it, and it would actually take away from it that people know that it's running Linux. It's even, I think it's better that people don't know. It's a gaming device. I just pick it up and I play my games. It doesn't matter what it runs. Us secret nerds can kind of give ourselves a pat on the back going, yeah, but it's running Linux. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think uh, the only thing... So yeah, you say basically it could be used as as an appliance or as a console, right? And I think where it can make a difference is if one of those gamers who uses it knows that it runs Linux, and then they hear about Linux somewhere else. They are like, yeah, my Steam Deck runs it, so it runs my games. You know, it might help some people switch, it might not. I don't put any such expectations. What Steam Deck really achieves to do is uh, getting games playable on Linux. Regardless of how likely it is, let's just say it's one out of a hundred. So 99 people, uh, the first 99 people who've bought the Steam Deck do not give a shit that the thing is running Linux. Then that one person is like, this thing it says it's running Linux and it seems to be running okay. I wonder can my laptop run that or whatever. With the amount of numbers that the Steam Deck is is firing out there, those conversion rates will start to add up, even if it's only like one out of a hundred. Yeah, it's it's all another benefit. I you know there are no there are no down, downsides. I I think uh, was the newest hottest game that came out, Baldur's Gate. Uh, is it three? I don't know. Not into it, but that's, I think that's already enabled. Yeah. I think it was a huge gamble from by Valve. I think like this could have bankrupted Valve the amount of money that they're pumping into it, or at at least cer- certainly put them into a, a severe financial hole that they'll probably take them th- themselves maybe half a decade or a decade to get themselves back out of if this hadn't worked out. But it's been a, a huge success, and I think Valve were the only company that could have done this. In other words, could have not. They had the clout and they had the name recognition with the hardware partners. They could go up to AMD and say, "Hey, AMD, we're thinking about making this console." Microsoft could have done it, but they wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. they? No, they would push Windows. Come on. <laughs> okay, so that's probably a good time to wrap things up. You can email us on show at lilyslas.com, and if you happen to be in the Dublin area and want to attend one of our meetups that we run through the Dublin Linux community, you can do so, and that will be linked in the show notes as well. Okay, say goodbye, Mike. Bye-bye. And it's bye from me.